Welcome to the Opportunity Podcast, where entrepreneurs come to learn from real buyers, sellers, and industry experts on the lesser known growth opportunities to build their online business empires. We'll uncover tactics veteran online business entrepreneurs have used to build, buy, flip, and sell their way towards personal wealth. Sit back, grab a coffee, and get ready to uncover hidden growth secrets. The Opportunity Podcast starts now. Welcome back to the Opportunity Podcast, your go-to resource for hidden growth opportunities throughout online business. We're your host. I'm Sarah. And I'm Brandon, and thanks for joining us for our latest episode. Today, we will be speaking with Brad Costanzo, the CEO of Costanzo Marketing Group and the principal of Costanzo Capital and the host of an award-winning podcast called The Bacon Wrapped Business. In this episode, Brad talks about his unusual start in entrepreneurship, creating info courses to teach magic tricks and how that inspired him into several businesses that he currently owns today. Unsurprisingly, he created an unorthodox approach to portfolio management And from investing in a wide range of niches and monetizations to crafting his own minority investments across his entire portfolio. Yeah, Brad's insights are made a lot richer thanks to his years of running his own podcast. And he comes armed with plenty of knowledge on how some of the best business experts manage their own deal flow. So you won't want to miss out on his stories. But we won't give away too much just yet. Let's dig into the interview, see what Brad has to share. And then at the end of the episode, we'll go over some of the best listings on the Empire Flippers Marketplace that highlight the growth opportunities we've learned about today. Let's get started. All right, everyone, welcome back to the Opportunity Podcast. We are so excited to have Brad Costanzo on with us today. Brad, how are you doing? I am fantastic. How are you? I'm doing well. And where are you calling from in the world right now? Sunny San Diego, California. That's awesome. Um, Calling from Mexico, also sunny, but San Diego is one of my favorite places. Where in Mexico are you? Merida? Oh, nice. I'm flying to Tulum tomorrow. Oh, no way. (laughs) Oh, that's so awesome. How long are you going to be there for? Just till Sunday. So Wednesday through Sunday. So a little quick getaway, get out of the oppressive California <laughs> lockdown. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, be prepared. I just left Playa del Carmen a few weeks ago, and they are pretty open and not really caring too much about the masks. So just yeah. a <laughs> forewarning on that side. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, looking forward to it. But, yeah, it's great to be on here on the show. And flip the sides. Usually I'm the one doing the interviews. I like yeah. It. I mean, hopefully, you know, we get to talk to you about some things today that might be a little bit refreshing. Like, I'm excited yeah. to get into some of these personal questions. And hopefully it's just like a fun time being able to talk about your perspective on some stuff. Now, of course, not everyone here is going to be an expert on who you are. So I was wondering if you kick things off. Tell us a little about, you know, who you are and what your entrepreneurial journey has looked like. Absolutely. And I'll kind of do it in reverse order. So right now, my primary business is split in between business owner. And sometimes like I've got my consulting business, that's one business I own. So I do work as kind of a growth advisor specializing on, you know, marketing and customer acquisition and profit maximization with my clients. And I do that on usually a fee plus oftentimes a percentage basis, whether that's just performance marketing or sometimes a percentage of the company. And in that case, you know, through the consulting I do there, I've done some consulting for equity or consulting for fee plus equity deals where I've got companies such as vitaminpatchclub.com is a company that I've got a holding in minority interest, but that is a consulting for equity position. And then there's another CBD marketplace that is launching soon, which I've got a third of the company. And then there's other companies that I got a percentage in that I help do growth with. And then in the past, I've obviously got my Costanzo Marketing Group, which I am the CEO in Costanzo Capital, where I both place like I place investment money along with some of the equity deals I do. In the past, I've done a lot of startups on my own and I have had you know, more failures than successes like any entrepreneur would. But, you know, I've started an e-com business in the coffee space and it was a really cool, fun brand, but it failed and I walked away from it. I actually walked away from it before it failed. But, and then prior to that, as I said, I'm kind of moving backwards. I've been consulting companies for a long time. In 2012, I sold a business, the very first business that I had started up as a digital entrepreneur. So I became a digital entrepreneur back in 2008. And I started an info product teaching magic tricks to guys who are trying to pick up girls at 
nightclubs. And it was funny, the way I got into that was I had read The 4-Hour Workweek, where Tim Ferriss said, you know, you can make money on really weird, crazy niche interests and if you're an expert in something. And I never felt like I was an expert in anything. But I read a book by Neil Strauss at the time, which was a New York Times bestseller book called The Game, Penetrating the Secret Society of Pickup Artists. And it was a really, really popular book, especially with single guys. I happened to read the book and I was dating a girl who's my wife now. I've been with my wife for 15 years. So, but I was reading the book and I was just laughing. It was like, oh, this is a really good book. And in the book, they talked about how to use magic tricks to pick up girls, but they didn't actually go into details. They just said that they did. And it was funny because I know like 20 different bar tricks that I used to win drinking money <laughs> with. And a once in a while, if when I was single, if I was flirting with a girl and I made a pack of matches disappear, she would think that was cool and it was a fun way to flirt. So I just remember thinking, wow, I wonder if this would be a way to make money online. So my business partner and I just cutting our teeth said, we're going to start a little weird niche business teaching magic tricks to guys to break the ice with girls and try to to draft off of this publicity that the book, The Game, was getting. And it ended up doing about a half a million dollars in our best year. And then it started to go down a little bit as I started to get interested in other things. And I sold that business back in 2012 to a group of investors out of New Zealand. And I had another software business at the time that I had started up that was called Pig Tones, which stood for politically incorrect GPS tones, where we, in essence, hacked into the Garmin and TomTom Tom GPS systems and replaced the voices with character and celebrity impersonations. And it was really funny, like they were using cuss words and they were just really, really funny GPS voices and sold that business, not for a lot, but we sold it for a little bit. The iPhone really ate that business up, but sold that in 2012 as well. So... My history is multiple different industries from small startups to some sales and consulting in pretty much almost every major vertical since then in the past really 10 years. That's awesome. I'm curious. I'm fixated on this magic trick thing. Like, Paul, is it to teach people magic tricks? Like, surely that you've had to have some people that was just like near impossible and that felt like an insurmountable thing to overcome. You know, it's hard to say. I don't know, because like it was an info product. So a lot of the guys would report back to me, the customers, hey, I did that and it worked. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't like I was individually teaching people. It was just an okay. info product. And I don't really know how successful a lot of people were just because I didn't really. It wasn't like a coaching program. But the tricks that I always taught were fairly simple. And it was like, here's a dollar bill. Here's how to make it look like you tore it up and how to make it reappear. I can teach that trick to anybody in like 30 seconds. So I would just do a little video of that. What was really funny about that program is it was me in my living room in front of my fireplace and I was saying, okay, so imagine I'm in a nightclub and imagine I'm talking to this beautiful woman. This is what I would say. This is what I would avoid saying. This is a trick I would do. Here's how to do the trick. All right, next trick. But it was just really funny because I was like, imagine a beautiful woman standing next to me. Imagine this is what she says. And I still crack up at the fact that I did a half million dollars one year teaching cheesy pick up tricks in front of my fireplace with no women in the video. <laughs> no, I just think that's awesome because it's like, I mean, clearly you spend a lot of your time guiding people and, you know, all of these complex things in entrepreneurship. But I was wondering, like, how does that compare to teaching somebody, you know, magic? But I mean, clearly it was yeah. like an info product and stuff like that. But yeah, yeah. it's good. I'm glad that tricks worked out for some people. You know, it was fun. The business itself was a marketing laboratory and it allowed mm. me to learn the ins and outs of digital marketing and whether it was info or physical product, et cetera, and just kind of learn what it takes to sell goods and services online. And I always went into it. I go into everything. This is like one of the key principles of whatever success I've had is I go into it with a learner's mind to say, look, even if this doesn't work out that well, I'm going to learn something because there is no failure. There's only feedback. And data that says, okay, you did this, it didn't work. What could you have done or what should you have done? Like when I started a, an e-commerce private label coffee brand, probably ended up costing me $10,000 and at the end of the day, and I didn't make any money. I would normally say I wasted a year of my life, but I didn't because I learned a lot of things to do and things to avoid when starting up an e-commerce business. And since myself and two partners are working on a new e-commerce launch business right now, a lot of the things have come in handy because I know where some of the gotchas were. Oh, that's awesome. I mean, like you said, there's sort of lessons that are hiding anywhere and everywhere. And I love that you're obviously doing that every day on your podcast, Bacon Wrap Business. You know, for those who, who don't know Bacon Wrap Business, can you walk us through that a bit and what your sort of goals are with this podcast? Yeah, Bacon Wrap Business is my podcast where 
it was one of those things, but I started it, I think in 2014, I want to say, and been about six and a half years now, I guess. And the goal of it, I had some friends telling me, yeah, you should do a podcast. And I never really thought much of it. And then I was sharing another friend of mine who had a podcast episode. I shared it on Facebook and I just happened to write in the status update. I was like, check out my friend Bob's podcast. He drops some bacon wrap business advice if I've ever heard it. And I just threw it out there and I stared at the words bacon wrap business and then I was just like, well, if I was ever to, maybe that would be a fun title for a podcast if I was ever to start one. Because I didn't want to start the Brad Costanzo show because I was like, I wouldn't listen to something like that. So who else would? But Bacon Wrapped Business was just kind of, you know, catchy enough and funny enough that allowed me to just get in there and have fun with it and see where it goes. And I never had a major desire to do one thing or other. It's just like, it's a great outlet. I'm talking to like some really smart people all the time anyway, and I never record them. And I mean, how great would it be to just to record these and build an audience? So I started to do that. And I always approach the show. I like to say on my podcast that I've got the most selfish show on iTunes because it's really hard to get on my show unless I personally want to learn about what you're doing. I don't care about Honestly, my audience comes last. I really do this for me. People I want to talk to about things I want to hear about and learn about. And I used it as not only a way to get free. It's not free information because I'm actually in return. I'm giving somebody my platform to share their story with my audience. But I get free information, free coaching. And at the same time, I open the doors with some really amazing people. And it's funny that by being selfish on the show, it allows me to ask questions that are authentic, curiosity-based questions. And my audience has really rewarded me for that from their feedback because they come back going, man, those are the exact questions I would want to know. And people don't really ask those questions on normal podcasts. They just tee it up as real softball questions. And I'm like, well, I don't because I like to feel like I'm letting other people eavesdrop on conversations I'm going to have no matter what. And because of that, it made it a valuable tool for me. It's made a valuable tool for my clients. And it's funny, I started to look back. I am just short of doing a million dollars in revenue from my podcast. I've never sold a single ad. And I'm not talking about affiliate revenue. I'm talking about client and other opportunities that have risen 80% of those from my guests, not even from my listeners. So it's been just a remarkable journey of, I just started to talk to people that I wanted to talk about, about things I want to talk about, and it paid very handsome dividends. Absolutely. I love that you can come out and just say, you know what, this is selfish. This is actually just something I wanted to do. I might as well record it. And then obviously to see where you are today with it is pretty cool. And, you know, I mean, just looking through the range of episodes that you have, like, I mean, you've talked to, it feels like everybody under the sun about just a range of topics. So it's kind of what we're going to nitpick from here today, because it's almost like you've got too much in a great way. So I wanted to get started with talking about your portfolio. We did talk about that offline a little bit, but yeah. we just want to get a picture of that here. I know you just told us some about your entrepreneurial journey, but what about your journey specifically on you know buying and selling businesses? What does your portfolio look like today? So right now it's a mixture. I just sold one business that I had earlier this year, about 11 months ago. I had a company in the home beer brewing market where I bought that off of a this was a friend's friend that I purchased, and it was a sub-six-figure deal, but a friend of mine just said, hey, you've sold a business. Can you help my friend Billy, who's trying to sell a business? And we got on the phone, and I just started to ask him questions, and he was just built a nice uh, high-traffic blog with some different monetization channels, and he was just over it, and he was wanting to do something else, and I was just kind of giving him advice on what sellers are going to look for when they're looking to buy a business. And I happened to say, well, you know, if you were to sell this today, do you have any idea what price? And he told me it was like one times earnings. And I was like, well, you know, what? I'll buy this. I didn't get on the phone with you to buy this from you, but I'll buy it from you. I'll give you uh, whatever it was. I owner financed it over 12 months. I just paid him at equal monthly installments over 12 months. And he said, sure. But then I went and I got two of my friends who are also in this business and I got them to buy in. I got them to buy two thirds of the business at 150% of the valuation that I bought it at like within a week. So I increased the valuation. I sold them two thirds. I basically got the business almost for free. And then we improved it a little bit and then sold it a couple years later. But that one I exited this year. And it wasn't for like crazy exit money. We profited, but it wasn't, it was more of an experience and a good learning experience because one of the big takeaways from that, it was actually smaller than I want to do. Like if I'm going to buy anything that requires any activity on my own, I want it to be a mid six figure and up business right now because it takes as much work to run a tiny one that it does a bigger one. 
The other ones I've got is I've got a minority share in Vitamin Patch Club. I've got a minority share, but a large minority share in a CBD based company that's launching hopefully in February or early March. Then I've got minority percentages in most of my portfolio as opposed to having a majority. And that's by nature right now. So, and they're not all e-commerce businesses, but one of them is another cannabis related company. I've got a position in a company that is doing a cannabis and CBD or CBD related roll-ups called CBD Capital Group. I'm a partner in that. I've got a position in a satellite launch company, if you would, which is totally out of the ordinary. This is more of an angel investment, but I did an angel investment as well as advisory for them. So I'm now on the board. Well, it's not on the exact board of directors, but I do advisory work for them, helping them with their pitch deck and messaging. And then there's a fintech app that I've got a percentage in. So most of my acquisition activity has actually been minority ownership with advising for equity. And even when I have done the acquisitions, I've done a couple other small deals. It's rarely am I coming out of pocket to pay for it. I'll kind of think of a creative way to either barter in or to owner finance those deals. And other times I've gone about just buying assets of a business. So I've probably bought three different customer lists in the past. I've bought a Facebook group and I've bought different assets as opposed to the entire business. And my thesis there is I'm really a bad operator of a business. You don't want me in there as the COO, but if I can find a way to get a hold of a valuable asset and then understand how to leverage that either in my business or elsewhere. That's kind of what I'm always looking for, but I'm not the average, let me just buy this business and run it or just buy it for my portfolio yet. Although I'm trying to uh, do a little bit more of that. Yeah. I'm glad that you brought just dumped that up. a lot on you there. No, no. <laughs> I think I just looked through my questions like, man, I want to go like 80 different directions, but <laughs> I think I'm really fixated on the idea of a minority ownership right now, because that's not something that we get to hear about every day on the podcast. Right. Obviously, you know, to have someone come on and say, well, I've actually got, if I'm getting this right, like a majority of your portfolio, it's minority ownerships, right? Mm -hmm. Getting that. You know, I'm wondering what has that sort of done for you and what's that outcome been like? Because I think we're getting more people arriving to even to online business and going, well, maybe I don't have to be the person that runs it. Maybe I can be a person that has minority investment in this and then see what does for my portfolio. I guess, has that been something that has allowed you to just even build a stronger portfolio since you've taken that move? Yeah. And especially because it also allows me to get into what I believe are better companies that have a higher growth potential mm -hmm. as opposed to waiting for the time. You know, when a seller wants to sell a business, he does it for a lot of reasons. One of them could be they're just bored and they want to move on. Another one could be because they're in trouble and they need the cash, right? So the home beer brewing business, he was bored and he wanted to move on. The other ones, there was a business I almost bought. They made custom gun holsters. And this is about two years ago or so. And they had been doing about 4 million a year and it had slipped down to about 3.3. And their primary channel of advertising, which was magazine ads, was no longer working. And they had never done any real digital marketing and Facebook ads or any of this stuff. They never emailed their customer list. And I found it really interesting. So I did a deal. He was actually a podcast listener. And we did a deal to where, look, I'll buy 80% of your business because my goal is to build it up and resell it. And I want you to maintain ownership. So the deal it was originally structured by 80% of your business. You retain 20% and I'll buy it at 100% owner financing because it had a downward trend and I wasn't about to give him cash dollars in, you know, that I could be using for marketing on something that it was going to have to be kind of a, a little bit of a turnaround or at least stem the bleeding. And I got down to the very, very, very last like week. This was about four months of due diligence. And this was the first real big one that I had looked at buying. And this is a, you know, seven figure acquisition. And I was in that moment. I was like, I don't know what I don't know. And I'm really nervous. So I, you know, hired some really good advisors and I went through this stage and right at the very last moment, I backed out of it because there was a couple things that made it too high risk, especially when at the last minute he said, I'm going to need 10% down. And there was a couple of big risk factors. That I said, well, I'm going to walk away from this, but let me run your email list, which you've never sent an email to 200,000 customers, and let me share the profits. Uh, just pay me 20% of the gross sales of anything your email list does. And he said yes. And within six months, I'd already made about $125,000 personally for me, just off of his list. And that's not including the revenue he made. So I flipped that from a 
potential acquisition into a lucrative consulting deal. I can't remember the exact reason I went there because I kind of rabbit trailed. We were talking about minority interests. In that case, he was kind of desperate. And I do love buying from desperate sellers in a lot of situations because most of the time is that when you're buying a business, you're not really buying a business. Oftentimes you're buying a situation and it's just like real estate. You make the most money when you buy a good asset from a desperate situation. Like just got divorced, just went through a major headache, whatever. I need to sell this thing for fire sale prices. And if I can structure a deal that makes sense for them and me, and it's a win-win, I come out ahead. The problem is those are harder to find. And if you do find them, they may be competitive, they may be complex, and you might be taking on somebody's problems that you don't want. I'm circling back to them taking a minority percentage. It's easier for me to convince a business that's doing well, but maybe they're hitting a plateau or they're going through growth pains and they need some extra effort, help, advice, expertise in order to get over the next you know, hurdle. And for instance, if I can structure anywhere from one to 20%, right? It really depends. Ownership on this, then I can come in and do what I do really well, which is, you know, growth hacking, growth advisory, et cetera. And I don't have to be the one who makes all the decisions in place. I don't have to be the one who has to operate it, but I can participate on the way up. Now, I like that because it frees up some of my time and worry. And I know that I'm potentially buying a better asset with higher momentum. But then one of the problems a lot of people get into is that they get minority equity in a business. And if that business doesn't plan on selling or monetizing your real minority interest, like maybe they just retain earnings and they don't pay it out or whatnot, then I'm just sitting here holding a minority share in a business that isn't really ever going to pay me out. So in those cases, I structure a put agreement, which are you guys familiar with the basic put option? Yeah. With trading options, it's the same as what you're talking about, correct? Yeah. So yeah. whenever I, like, let's say I were to take a 20% interest in your business and in exchange for, you know, growth advisory, et cetera, over the next couple of years. And I'll set up a structure where it says, look, you're definitely going to pay me my percentage of the profits, right? If you're doing a hundred thousand a year in profits, you're going to pay me my 20%. But after a certain, either a certain set of time or a certain financial benchmark that says, okay, if the business itself is worth a million now, let's say in the next two years, as long as the business is worth 2 million or more after that period, I have the right to sell you back my shares at an agreed upon multiple or at a, I can set the multiple now at like, let's say three X EBITDA you have to buy my minority shares back after two years and your revenue is doubled or earnings have doubled, I get the right to sell you back my shares. So I build in liquidity for myself so that I'm not sitting on a minority investment forever and this guy never decides to sell. So that's one of the ways I protect myself on the exit side is I just write it in as a contract. It's like one paragraph that gives me the right to sell my shares back at a certain milestone. Yeah, no, that makes total sense. And this actually brings up a really interesting topic as well, just because of a new program that we just launched called EF Capital, where mm -hmm. essentially we're doing the same exact same thing that you're talking about, where we're giving investors the opportunity to make a passive investment into online businesses and an operator that they would pick and choose from. We currently have six on the board that are available and you would pick an operator. The operator would run the business. They get a higher leverage percentage since they're the one actually scaling and growing the business on a daily basis. And then the Investors are taking more of a passive stance in kind of similar to, I guess, what you're saying, where you're taking a minority share, but you're doing more of the manual version of what we're trying to automate for investors with our new EF Capital program. So on the EF Capital, so I went to the page earlier and I kind of looked mm -hmm. at it briefly, but this conversation is the first I've really heard of it. So mm -hmm. if I'm an investor in EF Capital, you find a deal. And then does the investor typically fund all or it looks like part of the deal? Is there a minimum investment required? Yeah. So there's a minimum of 10,000 that the investor would put down. And then depending on the deal size, we're, they're usually between 1 million and 2 million as far as the six deals that we currently have that we're starting off with. Obviously, yep. those will change over time. We're doing more basic monetizations. I think we have one or two FBA monetizations on the board currently, but a majority of them are content, I believe, for now. And then basically the operator is already 
tried, tested. They have a proven track record of growing assets that they've purchased from us or acquired. They have a record that you know investors can make sure that they're going to be choosing the correct operator. And then ultimately, where you can really limit your risk is investing into multiple operators, not just one, because we are ultimately gauging that there is going to be some percentage of a failure, obviously, with sure. online or business investing. Yeah. So in general, this Empire Flippers Capital Program that we've just recently launched and we're getting up and running now is ultimately doing a one platform, one stop shop for investors to do basically what it is you've been doing over the years as well, too. And it's a really great program. We have Mike Vrakovich, who is leading this program as well. And yeah, he's been putting a lot of sweat equity into this program to make sure that it's a solid investment for investors as well, too, which kind of leads me into the next question as well. So you're going in and you're making these deals, you're taking in minority shares into like some of the businesses that you had mentioned earlier. Now, how are you approaching your due diligence when looking at a, a business that you would like to take a minority share in or invest in? Is there something specific that you're looking for, maybe in a particular niche or even an industry? Or do you have more of like a general outlook on the business and projection and what you feel is going to benefit your portfolio that you currently have, keeping that in mind instead? Yeah, it's far from structured. I don't have specific criteria there. I probably should, but most of these deals that I end up do, I end up stumbling across through my network, et cetera. I'm not out there actively prospecting for those kind of deals. So I look at, do I like the person that I would be partnering with? Do I like the product or service? Do I like you know the way the business is going now? Like if, for instance, would I take this company on as a client? Right. So the kinds of companies I won't take on as a client is, you know, do I not get along with that person? Do they have some aspect of their market, their business, their offer, their pricing, et cetera, that makes it really hard to get them results as a client? Mm -hmm. And if I wouldn't take them on as a client, even if they paid me, then I might be willing to take them on as an equity partner. If I wouldn't take them on as a client, but I'm not going to put any money in, in that case. And I might say, look, you give me equity in your business and then hopefully you do what I say. And if I don't think I can move the needle as a mm -hmm. client, then I probably can't move the needle as a equity partner. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the first things I look at is, do you need me to move the needle? Or is this like just an opportunity to get in on something like you guys don't even need me, but I've got an opportunity. Those are more rare. And those are like angel and seed investments, et cetera, that I've made in the past. But like with vitamin patch club, Dot com. I saw an opportunity for me to get in and bring some of my marketing expertise to it. But at the same time, most of his capital was going back into the business. And it didn't make as much sense to just pay me that money when I liked the prospects of the ability to build this business up and then uh, sell it. So I took a equity position in this company and it's a graduated position. So without going into the, all the details, I take 10% just for access to me. And then after a certain financial benchmark that we set, which is, it's not a slam dunk one. It takes some effort, but it's also not impossible. Then my equity gets moved up to 25%. So that's kind of the way I've structured that. But I believe in the entrepreneur. I believe in the product. I believe in the market. And I see the potential there. So there's no framework criteria. It's just gut feeling. And then sometimes depending on what it is, I'll just do a little bit more due diligence and see if it makes sense. Mm. But for anybody who thinks I, I'm doing things structured and organized and in super intelligent way, a lot of times I'm winging it and mm. seeing how it goes, to be honest, yeah. that should, yeah. should get some of your listeners hope to go, yeah. oh, wow. Well, I, I mean, you, you throw it at the wall, you see what sticks and you know, go from there. Right? Yeah, it um, really is. Yeah, I'm no, it's an interesting mentality that you have as well, too. It's, I guess it's kind of different mindset or different framework, I guess, to acquiring a digital asset, right? Like most yeah. investors are looking at an acquisition and they're saying, okay, how am I going to grow this? How am I going to limit my risk and continue to grow this business while I'm the sole owner of this business? Where yeah. you're taking a different standpoint, you're saying, okay, if I can't move the needle as an investor, why am I going to invest in this at all, right? Like yes. if the business doesn't have the potential, then why am I going to fork out all of my cash and then take over this person's risk because, you know, they just went through a divorce or whatever the case may be, you know, they're just trying to make a quick sale. So um, really interesting mentality that you have there. So you told us a little bit about your history and businesses that you've acquired and built. I'm curious. So which business in particular was the first business that you purchased? And then how did you go about either raising the funds or raising the capital for that asset? Or did you fork the cash out of your pocket for that very first first business that you did buy, not build. I will say this. I've never raised capital to purchase a business ever. I have always either 
done owner financing Mm -hmm. or consulting for equity. So I've never written a check for a business in my life or had to raise debt for that. One of my businesses that I bought, and I mentioned this one recently, I bought it and then I sold, after I closed on it, I sold two thirds of the business to two partners who ended up running most of it. And that was, I guess, kind of a a reverse financing thing. Like I'll raise the money after I buy it. And Mm -hmm. by getting them to buy in at a higher valuation, I bought a business back in, I want to say 2000 and what was it? 14 or 15. That was kind of an affiliate content site. I bought that with owner financing, but I've been fortunate not to have to deploy my own capital or have to raise capital from others. This Mm -hmm. uh, CBD business that with my other two partners that is being launched. This is not an acquisition, but this is one where they were going to launch the business and, you know, consulting for equity, I got a third of the business. We are most likely going to raise money for this, but that's not an acquisition. This is much more of a startup. So it's not really as appropriate to this question, but I don't know if that answers the question. I've just been fortunate enough to not have to deploy my own capital or have to raise too much elsewhere. Mm. Not that I'm against doing that. It's just the opportunities I've come across have not warranted it. Yeah, no, it's a really smart approach. And yeah, I was also curious to learn from you as well. You know, what do you think are maybe some of the most, you know, undervalued or maybe, you know, some of the creative strategies for securing these types of acquisitions that you're taking this approach on? Are you saying, you know, by consulting and offering and or maybe doing a buyer financing or buyers financing approach is maybe some of the most underrated or undervalued approach to, you know, acquiring digital assets? I know you've spoken with many, many people on your podcast as well about, where to take this approach in raising capital or to how to purchase an asset without using your own money. So what would you yeah. say is the best approach and the most creative strategy in performing this? Yeah. So there's a few ways. Now, obviously, as I mentioned earlier, the situation that the seller is in matters a lot based on what they're willing to do. So I love owner financing and it's rare, but if you can get hundred percent owner financing and just you know pay for the business out of the business's revenue, then that's a fantastic way to come in there, especially if it's no risk on your part. But you know, oftentimes you get a little bit more desperate of a seller who agrees to that. There are other ones that can be done, which is if you find like, especially if you come at this with marketing expertise and business growth expertise, like I do, this is easier. If you're coming in with just, Hey, I want to own a business, but I don't know anything about business. I just got capital. I want to spend some of my money. This doesn't work as well. But if I see a good example was this business that I almost purchased, which was the gun holster business. They had a 200,000 person customer email list that had never been sent an email before. And I actually made good money off of this, but I also made a mistake. And I'll explain if I could go back in time how I would have done this and I probably would have made 10x the money. So that 200,000 person customer list is not necessarily worth anything. It sounds great, but if, if it's been developed over five years, you may have a lot of dead weight on that list. And you don't know if they're going to get a 5% open rate or what the engagement's going to be, or if they're going to spam complain you if you just start emailing them promotions. To me, that was like an insurance policy that we didn't know the value of it. And what I did was I just said, I'm not going to buy your business at the last minute for these reasons, but let me just, in essence, turn into a consultant, a performance-based consultant. What I should have done is this. He was asking for about $110,000 down, and then he was going to own or finance 90% of the business. I didn't want to spend $110,000. What I should have done is said, look, I'll agree to that, and we're going to defer that down payment for 60 days. And I'm going to test out your email list. And every single penny of that newfound email revenue is going to go towards my down payment until it's paid for. And I don't make a penny until it is. And then after that, I basically, you know, we're, let me pay for it out of the performance that I'm able to do. And I know a hundred percent, he would have said yes to this, but I missed that opportunity. The other thing I didn't do is say, okay, I'll do it. Or, you know, let me take the control of your email list, but let me have an option to buy your business Instead of buying it for 1.2 million, instead of buying it right now, let me have an option to buy it for 1.2 million in three months or six months. And then let me work with your email list and see what kind of damage I can do in, you know, with whatever and utilize that money as my down payment. So if you can identify low hanging fruit and things that you would do if you were in control, you can oftentimes 
just negotiate the ability to do that and pay for the company out of the proceeds you generate. And that's what I love to do. So for instance, find me a business with an undercapitalized but large enough email list. Let me come in there and I'll probably be able to pay for the down payment on it by itself just with that. So that's one strategy, if that makes sense. I don't know if I confused you with the analogies or... No, yeah, it was total mistake. Yeah. Cool. So I just love taking creative ways to do it as opposed to just, I'm not at the place right now where I'm just placing passive money into something that I have no control over with very few exceptions. Like the companies I've done that with are with some of like some of the most world-class like entrepreneurs out there and it's like a tech company or something. Yeah, I think, you know, just listening to you, essentially kind of ask or answer my next question. I wanted to talk to you a bit more about, you know, your deal structures and earnouts and things of that nature and a bit of the takeaways there. You know, I'm kind of wondering beyond looking for like the low hanging fruit and asking yourself, you know, what would I do if I was to own that business in this moment? You know, what would be your other advice, other takeaways for potential buyers who are looking to creatively structure deals as you have? Well, it's really to understand that, I mean, the most key part of any negotiation, which most people should know, but it's surprising at how many don't, is the importance between price and terms. You either get your price and my terms, or you get your terms and my price, right? You want all cash? I'm going to pay you less. If you're willing to finance this, I'll give you a, a higher price. Or if you're willing to play with me, you know, something like I just mentioned this, I'll take a percentage or I'll put in, but let me come in and try to make the company pay for my down payment out of some of the work I can do. That's the mindset I always go into. And if I don't know how to do that, I don't need to as long as I can access the people who do. So for instance, I may identify that there is an opportunity to better negotiate with suppliers and get better terms on that or to bring debt down and to pay this off or to even sometimes just get money released from the merchant account that has been held up. And I've done that with clients before as I just help them, you know, negotiate with a merchant account to release funds. And all of a sudden that release is like six figures worth of funds that they probably could have done if they knew how to talk to merchant accounts. And I do. And I'm just always looking for creative ways that I can add value without coming out of pocket. And if I don't know how to do it, I surround myself with advisors and colleagues and people that I know who I can make a call and say, hey, can you look at this and tell me what you would do? And maybe we even go in on it together. You know, we mentioned offline. I've oftentimes described myself not as an entrepreneur, but as an opportunist. I'm always looking for the different opportunities. And the difference between an opportunity seeker, though, and an opportunist, in my definition, is an opportunity seeker is looking for a fully baked out opportunity, just waiting for him to seize it. But an opportunist, is somebody who recognizes the signs of what might be an opportunity and then organizes resources and capital and people, et cetera, to go create that opportunity that others may have missed out on. And that's kind of the overall mindset. Yeah, well, I'm glad you mentioned that because I've written a note to myself here is like, you know, this what you're saying, it definitely sounds like the definition of the opportuneur, which really like the sort of idea behind it is exactly why we started this podcast and why it's sort of aptly named the, the Opportunity Podcast, because I think Brennan and I were seeing, you know, after a conversation with sellers and buyers that, you know, all those nuggets of wisdom were there for people, but they just weren't accessible. I probably in exactly kind of what you saw with your podcast. It's like these really good conversations that I just kind of wish I could record. Yeah, yeah. It's the same thing, you know, and I think that's why we wanted to start it because it's like, if you put on that creative hat, the opportunities are there in front of your face. You just either need to listen, you need to know they're there or, you know, get out of your box and start looking for them. Yeah, you know, one of the best I've given this resource to everybody that I've talked to where it's just such a mind opener. And Jay Abraham ebook is only like 60 pages long and it's free. Mm -hmm. He gives it away free. If you search the web for Jay Abraham mind shift challenge. So mind shift is one word challenge. And then like, just look for PDF. You can download it for free on his website. I think it's filled with anecdotes and stories and just short little things that it's designed, like he says, to just shift your way of thinking to what's possible. And it's everything from creative financing to barter to leveraging people's passion as opposed to their money. And yeah, I bet you didn't know you could do, you could acquire something like this, for instance. You know, one of my favorite examples from that book was he tells a story. This wasn't him. This was somebody else. 
that years ago wanted to buy a Porsche dealership. And the Porsche dealership was selling for $7.5 million, and he had gotten the owner of the company to agree to $750,000 down, so 10% down, and owner financed the rest. But this investor did not have $750,000. But what he did is he put an ad in the newspaper or something similar, because this was, I think, back in the 80s or 90s, and he said something to the nature like, Porsche lovers, drive a brand new Porsche every year for the rest of your life, one-time payment, $75,000. And they're like, what? So he gets a whole bunch of people fielding his calls. And he just said, yeah, for a one-time investment of $75,000, you will get to drive a brand new Porsche every single year at no extra cost. And he only needed 10 people. 10 people said yes. They gave him 75000 Then what he did, now he's got his seven hundred and fifty grand, buys the dealership, owner finances the rest. So now every year he gets at least 10 new Porsches, like Porsche 911s, and he gives them to his 10 I'm using the word investors in quotes because these are not equity investors. He simply allows them to drive one of the new Porsches for one year and then turn it back in. And he uses the dealership to insure them. And by the time they turn them back in, the one-year depreciation is still above or break even to his dealer cost. Mm -hmm. So it basically cost him nothing to finance the down payment of this dealership and the investors don't have any say in the business. If he sells the business, they don't have anything else because they just paid for the right to access the goods of the dealership. And I just remember reading that going, I'll be damned, there really is anything possible. He goes, yeah, in this case, I'm leveraging their passion in exchange for money. They don't necessarily need equity in my business if I can find another way to give them what they want. And the book is chock filled with little things like forehead slapping. I never would have thought about that unless I knew that was possible. And that's one of the many resources that has kind of opened my mind to, you know, the art of the deal for lack of a better terminology. Yeah. I love that story because I think it illustrates what can be done with, you know, business doesn't have to be static. It's never static. I mean, it's just way too moldable, anything but static. Yet, I think there's sometimes a static approach to entrepreneurship and and even investment strategies. And I think what you just illustrated there just shows like anything could be an investment if you, you know, put the right approach to it. And it kind of leading into my next question, because I think sometimes on this like loan quest to talk to people about online businesses, obviously, this is our world in particular, make this a great investment model, but you've just kind of got so many people that are going, well, I mean, I don't know how to deal with that. That doesn't look like real estate or, you know, stocks, like I'm not comfortable Mm -hmm. with that. And I'm wondering, you know, you as a business owner, you know, and buyer and seller using your businesses as investments, how has that worked out for you? And how, you know, would you be able to sort of stand up and say, actually, this does make a powerful investment strategy and people should start considering this versus is just saying, you know, it's only these few investment models that I'm comfortable with. Yeah, it is hard. It depends upon the person's degree of experience, right? So if somebody's coming out of corporate and they've never invested in a business or they've never run a business, then they don't know what they don't know. And the ins and outs and the fluctuations of a business might shock them because they're used to steadier growth. They're used to a stock going up you know, eight to 10% a year. They're used to going down maybe 10 or 20% a year. They're not used to the fluctuations and the things that happen in a real business. Conversely, if you've got maybe a previously successful business owner, like myself right now, you know, I've run businesses that have both failed and succeeded and I know what to expect. So if I'm going to put the money into another business, I at least am going to go in with eyes wide open and understand that things are going to fluctuate you know, quite a bit. So I'm going to have a lot more familiarity with it. And I think that's obviously one of the key elements, especially like for you guys, when you're dealing with all types of different buyers, you're dealing with people who just want a passive investment. But yeah, like investing in businesses is totally different than real estate. And it's totally different than, you know, putting it in stocks and bonds and Bitcoin and all the other opportunities they have. At the same time, one of the things I love about that is You can make a passive investment in a business, but if you can make a semi-active one where you actually have some say or you have the ability to pull some strings and help increase the sales, maybe it's just through a connection, somebody you know, then it can be one of the most powerful investments you can ever make because the ability for a business to scale, increase valuations, sell for a much higher multiple than you bought it for is, there's nothing else like it. I think that you have the life-changing aspect. You know, it's a good point. You know, if you've got that semi-active role, because we talk to people every day, and I'm sure you do as well, where it's like, 
taking ownership of, you know, that one business is what changed their early retirement, you know, their entire life path in particular. It sounds like your life path in particular has probably changed over time as you started owning your own businesses. So absolutely. sometimes those are the things you can't exactly put a dollar amount on, but you know, the most powerful. We talked a lot of sort of about the ups and downs, you know, I want to get in a little bit deeper on say the challenges that you've faced, because those are usually where the best yeah. lessons are hiding. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and what would you say the greatest challenges that you faced as a buyer and how did you overcome them? As a buyer, it's the awareness of my ignorance. I'll never forget the first time I bought a business and just thinking, oh, crap, like I'm actually going to do this. What if I mess this up? What am I not asking? What questions? And it was that I don't know what I don't know. And I was really nervous that I was going to miss something and that I was going to get myself in over my head and that I was going to screw something up. And then in the rear view mirror, I was going to go, yeah, was so stupid. Why'd you miss that? And I think it was just nerves. That was one of the biggest things. The other challenge is, you know, so typically when I've bought a business, it has not been a passive thing. It's been, I'm buying it a somewhat active role, either full time or partial. And my personal bandwidth and energy available to work on that business has been a challenge where I touched on this earlier, but the home beer brewing business, it was a smaller deal, sub six figures. And it was just too small for me to actually spend a lot of time on. And I remember when I bought it or on the day before I bought it, I just remember thinking to myself, okay, well, go back to Tim Ferriss, four hour work week. Well, this is a business that's already making money. It's relatively steady. I'll bet if I only spent four hours a week on this business, I could easily keep it afloat and even make it do better. What I didn't gauge was that those four hours a week I could spare, but they weren't going to be four quality hours because by the time I was done working on the bigger parts of my business that make a lot more money, now I'm going to devote an extra hour a day, for instance, to this other one, it's not my quality hours. And I just became really, really aware that quality of time matters versus just quantity of time. And it got to that point where I was just like, I know I need to do these things. I just don't have the time and energy to do it. And it's too small of a business to afford to just pay somebody to go in and do it the way it needs to be done. And that's a big challenge I had. That's why I like to buy slightly bigger businesses, especially if they're going to take any of my time to help run and operate. But I think, yeah, the biggest challenge for me is just like, what do I not know? What If I'm buying a business that I don't have super direct experience with, where this is like a slam dunk for me, I get real nervous just thinking that I'm missing something. You know, that's where bringing in the right advisors and surrounding yourself with the right people is really one of the most important ways to overcome that, I found. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's a great point where it's just like, we talk about the importance of humility sometimes in entrepreneurship, where you sometimes have to take a step out and go yeah, I, I don't know what I don't know. And I'm actually going to be better and probably have more cash in my pocket at the end of this, acknowledging that where, you know, and, and leaning on the right people. I know you said that a lot before that you've sort of outsourced and your opportunistic approach allows you to get the experts in the room that helps you make the magic happen. Yeah, exactly. Speaking of, I guess, sort of getting fixated on the opportunity element. So obviously this time period's been nuts, mm-hmm. goes without saying, and you've seen the world and markets change a lot in this past year. I'm wondering in the midst of everything, where are you thinking are the greatest growth opportunities? Well, e-commerce is obviously in 2020 has really proved itself as such a tremendous growth opportunity for people to do it right. At the same time, there's probably never been a more explosion of like competitive e-commerce products, et cetera. So, you know, whenever you get, you know, that opportunity, everybody rushes in, it becomes more competitive. So, you know, nothing's a perfect opportunity there, but I like those. I like focusing on somewhat essential businesses. One of the ones I'm with a business partner we are looking at right now is IT service businesses, like real mainstream businesses that oftentimes are called managed service providers. And they work with local businesses to help maintain their networks and security, et cetera. Although it's a tech related business, it deals with other people's online you know, networks, et cetera. It's not by itself an online business. One of the things I like about that is it's an essential business as more people are going virtual 
and will continue to. I think it's going to be increasingly in demand. And there's a higher barrier to entry to that than your typical online business. Like I love e-commerce for many reasons, but the only thing I don't love about it is that it's got a lower barrier to entry. And if somebody's got a few bucks, they can spin something up and they can knock your product off or they can compete with you just on price, et cetera. And it can be a little bit hairier. So I always like to look at something that there's a degree of uh, protection or what investors like to call a moat around the castle that you know, it's not just easy to spin something up and prove it. And a great example of that is info products, right? Like, so info products are an amazing business to get started with because the the cost of goods sold is really almost nothing. Like, especially if let's say you're selling an ebook or an online course or a course on how to sell magic tricks, right? Somebody could have easily, I was actually really surprised that somebody paid me money for that where they paid me six figures. They could have easily copied my product just have somebody else teach the exact same tricks or throw a few new ones in there. And that would have cost them probably less than a thousand dollars. And then they could have spent like, let's just say that they bought my business for a hundred thousand. It was more than that, but for round numbers, they could have spent $99,000 on marketing, but they gave it to me and they paid me in cash. So I was super happy, but it also goes to show that in like info, there's not a big moat. Somebody can rip you off and make it their own a lot easier in e-commerce. If I'm buying a product that's just, hey, this is somebody else who's just selling another product like somebody else and they're competing on nothing but price, chances are I'm not going to want to buy that. But if I can buy a brand or a community or something that has some degree of uniqueness that's hard to to copy, then that's one of the things I'm going to look closer at. So I want there to be some kind of a barrier to entry. In fact, one of my favorite books on this topic, have you guys read or heard of MJ DeMarco's book, Millionaire Fast Lane. Uh, yeah, I was yes, actually going to bring that up with you. Uh, one of your older episodes with Carl and Adam from Dealmaker Wealth Society you had back in May. I remember you brought this book up as well. <laughs> Love that book. Have yeah. you guys read it or no? Not yet. I've oh, been having oh. it on my list of <laughs> one of the books, the audio books I plan on listening to this so week. So I actually. loved it. And if I was to kind of summarize a couple pieces, he said, you know, first of all, the way real wealth is created is with an event, right? Like a sale, like an event, like if you're able to sell something for 5X, for instance, earnings, what you would make in a year, well, that's like somebody giving you five years of your life. But it's also, you know, if you're doing a million a year in net income and you're able to sell something for $5 million, all of a sudden in your pocket, that's really, really good money. And he said, most business owners do not necessarily get wealthy just by the cash flow that their business provides. Most of them, when they really hit it, it's because they sold their business. So the fast lane to wealth is owning or having a business that you can engineer an exit event. And then he gives two analogies that I'll share with you, which I loved it, or at least one analogy is he started off saying that, look, get rich. People think that get rich quick doesn't exist, but they're confusing it with its evil cousin, get rich easy, Mm -hmm. get rich quick exists, but you have to change the way you think about what quick is. So for instance, if you were to work 12 to 18 hours a day for five years on a business, and you sold that business for 10 million bucks, right? Did you get rich quick? Well, compared to working at a business for 40 years, you did Mm -hmm. like five years to make five, $10 million. That's quick. Mm -hmm. You can blink and five years are gone. And I remember that paradigm shift was redefine what quick means. It doesn't mean overnight and it doesn't mean easy, but it can happen quickly. Now, he says in order to do that, he has his like various commandments of a fast lane business. And one of them is, if I can remember this, it's been years since I've read it, but there needs to be a market need. You need to have control over the business, which means you have to be able to trigger the sale because if you're a minority owner and you can't trigger the sale when somebody comes along, then you can't exit. That's why I engineer a put option agreement with my minority shares. The other thing is it can't be completely dependent upon your time. You have to be able to leverage somebody else's time to run it. And there has to be kind of a difficulty to get in because if everybody can get into this business, you don't have a very valuable business. And one of the examples he uses is multi-level marketing. Multi-level marketing is predicated on get everybody else in this business. It's super easy to get into it. That's why nobody's ever sold you know, their multi-level marketing downline, their channel. They don't do it. It doesn't exist because everybody can get in and the whole business model is predicated on creating competitors for yourself, which you get a piece of. But that's why he's like, create, there should be a degree, whether it's complexity or something else, it should be hard to get in. It should be scalable 
not dependent upon you. You should be able to control the exit and there should be a market need for it. So that's mm-hmm. like, if you don't read the book, that's the main takeaways. Yeah, no, really solid point. And as you had mentioned, stepping away from being basically the the lead of operations and your investment is ultimately where you can scale and grow and hire the people that can take over these operations for you and then exit from the business much easier because now you have a sellable asset. You're not the face of the business, if you will. But yeah, I completely agree with you on that as well. And then just one more kind of wrapping this up as well with a few more last questions for you. So what advice would you give to maybe we have some of our listeners right now that are listening to your story. They're like, wow, you know, Brad, this guy has everything figured out. He's taking a different mindset, Far different from that. approach. <laughs> well, I'm sure, you know, I, just from hearing your mentality, your mindset behind your acquisitions is amazing. It's something different that we don't often hear. So I do admire that as well. But what advice would you give to maybe someone who's trying to buy their first business or maybe doesn't have that the knowledge and how to raise maybe the funds or how to do a, you know, buyer financing? You know, what advice would you give them when first starting out looking for that first business to acquire? So obviously, to the first thing I would say is to do a good analysis of yourself mm-hmm. versus like, are you just trying to be a passive investor or do you want to have any kind of an active role and really understand, you know, what you're getting into because the approach is going to be slightly different. The second one is to realize that you don't need to know everything if you can access the people who do. And that is a different statement than you don't need to know everything if you know the people who do. Because there's a lot of things I need to know, but I don't know them off the top of my head if I can access the people who know it. So that may just means, all right, can I research who knows this? And can I either afford to pay them for their advice? Can I partner with them and give them equity in my business? Can I interview them on my podcast and pick their brain for an hour and get what I need and move on, right? Like there's a lot mm-hmm. of ways. Can I read their book? There's a lot of ways to access knowledge that you don't have and to realize that it's really out there. Like everything you want to do is very, very possible because if it's not against the laws of physics, The only thing standing in your way is knowledge of how to do it. And there's a lot of ways to get that knowledge. As I said, that can be hiring advisors, that can be partnering with advisors, that can be reading, taking courses, you know, signing up for coaching programs. You can learn it or you can just find a way through it. So that's one really key piece is don't let the lack of knowledge keep you back as long as you're willing to go get that knowledge, you know, hell or high water. The other thing is to realize that all deals, everything in life is negotiable. And I've never found a single business that I've bought with owner financing where the owner offered owner financing. I asked for it. And oftentimes I would make the case for it where like, listen, you know, you've been actually losing money the past year. You're on a downtrend. I don't want to catch a falling knife. I don't want to uh, give you money that's going to go into your pocket. That's not, you know, they could otherwise be used for marketing expenses. If I were to stabilize your income and just pay you You know, what are you making now? You're making 20,000 a month from the business. What if I pay you 30,000 a month and I just stabilize your income? That's exactly how I got the 100% owner financing deal to work out. What if I just stabilize your income and just pay you 50% more than you're making right now? Would you be willing to take that? And they said, yes. So it's just realized that there's a lot of ways to skin the cat, ask questions, don't be overly intimidated, but surround yourself with experts however you can and be openly admit, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm in over my head because a lot of people want to help others. You'd be so surprised at how many people are willing to lend a hand if you simply go into it saying, I need help. I love that. I think that it's a good time to sort of take a step back and and I don't think this is an easy thing to do, but like ask a high level question here. What would you say that you're most proud of in your entrepreneurial journey? I'm proud of the fact that I've bounced back from my failures fairly well without without a lot of PTSD, I guess I should say. Mm. (laughs) Like I have yet to make millions of personal dollars from my business. Like none of my business have put, you know, like eight figures in my pocket. You know, I've made seven figures, but you know, it's not like that stuff is stuff I'm the most proud of. I think I'm the most proud of the fact that I've had successes. I've had big failures. I've bounced back. I've lost every penny on bad investments in the past, although never from a business I bought. They were usually like passive investments like oil and gas, real estate, just different things like this, stocks. And I've went to zero like two or three times. And I've started businesses. Like I mentioned that coffee business, spent a year of my life, you know, lost out, I had my tail between my legs and it sucked, but I bounced back from it right away. I was very resilient. And I think that's what I'm most proud of because I know that 
I've been to the worst case scenario several times. It's not that bad, especially the wiser I get, I can mitigate that more. And it gives me more courage to do something bigger next time, knowing that failure isn't the end of the world. Mm, that's an excellent point. The worst case scenario is usually survivable. I think we all need a reminder of that from time to time. It's important to know because that's usually the reason why people, they don't take that risk. They don't take that step. And then without it, they don't end up where they would like to be in life or they might not end up where you are in life, despite probably aspiring to be like you. You know, earlier when you were talking about you've had such a wild journey and it seems like you've done just kind of a bit of everything. I mean, making half a million off teaching guys magic tricks, like for example, <laughs> very, very unexpected. Yeah, it's really awesome. <laughs> could have been something I could have used back in the Navy when I was traveling around. It would have right? been, I would have <laughs> yeah. been one of your customers for sure. <laughs> yeah, <That's> that <laughs> the reason I was asking about that, because, you know, I was thinking down the line, we like to end our interviews on a lighter note and ask about, you know, what your funniest moment has been as an entrepreneur. I was kind of hoping you had seen somebody try and fail at magic tricks. And I don't know, had a good story out of that, but that's fine. I'll, I'll open the floor because I'm sure you've got something in there. What would you say has been your funniest moment as an entrepreneur? Funniest? Mm -hmm. I know it's hard. This is usually a tough one. <laughs> okay. So there was one, I'll give two, and they probably both revolve around the magic business because one of them was like, we had a little logo of a, like a, it was like a, of a Puma was like part of the logo of the magic trick thing. The, the site was called Puma Skills and it stood for Pickup Magic Artist. And I was like, I put the magic in Pickup Artists. I love the acronym. <laughs> but yeah, it was so great. cheesy. My partner and I, we had this Puma that we found on like stock photos and he was like ready to pounce. And it was really Pun hilarious. Intended. Then, <laughs> yeah. Yes. And a guy sends in a picture. He got a tattoo of our logo. Oh my oh, gosh. Wow. Awesome. Yeah. Now I didn't say, it didn't say <laughs> Puma skills. It was just that he loved the Puma, but I was like, wow. Yeah. But he was a big fan and he got that. And I just remember my partner, I just laugh. But the other, the funniest part. So when I was running this business, my stage name was Brad Jackson. So I had a pen name with it, but I was on video and stuff like this. And it was really funny because I always told my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife, honey, do not subscribe to my newsletter because none of the stuff I'm telling these guys are true. Like I'm fully admit that all of the stories in my newsletter were made up. Like I was like, I'd write to my newsletter, I guys, I just went out last night and I picked up all these girls and brought them back to my place and all this. It was just cheesy stuff, but you can get away with anything when you're writing in the pickup and seduction niche. So was there a degree of fibbery? Yes. And I just always laughed at, with my wife saying, don't read my newsletter because none of it's true. <laughs> that being said, my wife's from Brazil and we were visiting Brazil and we were in the town of Recife one year. And yeah. this is like, I don't it's know, my, 2000 and my bucket list. Actually, I'm currently in Sao Paulo. So it's funny that you mentioned that. Very cool. Very <laughs> yeah. cool. So we're in Recife and I sent an, an affiliate newsletter. I was promoting an affiliate product to my newsletter list. And I just said to the list, Hey guys, Brad Jackson here, blah, blah, blah. You guys should go check this product out by Joe Schmo. It's really good. It shows you how to pick up girls. I'm just down here in Recife, Brazil, with my girlfriend and we're hanging out. So, you know, ciao from Brazil. And I get an email back from this guy named Guto, Guto Santana. And Guto was like, Brad, I live in Recife, big fan. I would love to show you around, let me know. And I'm like, I looked him up on Facebook and he looked like a totally normal guy. So I said to my girlfriend, let's hang out with Guto. He's like a musician at a bar. And he came and picked us up in his car and we get in the car and he's like, Brad, what's up, man? And we were in the car and my wife's in the, girlfriend's in the back seat. And he just goes, man, I can't believe I'm hanging out with Brad Jackson. This is amazing. And I looked back at my girlfriend and her eyes were rolling in the back of her head. Uh. And I'm just dying laughing. Going, uh. I could, I'm internationally known, sweetheart. Yeah. But it, was, it was just one of those moments where I was like, here I am, this guy just marketing this stuff out of my bedroom. And I'm internationally known, get a tour guide in Brazil from all this stuff. And it was just one of those cool, funny moments of like, Wow internet marketing and digital marketing and all this, like anything's possible. And you can be anyone in the process. <laughs> Hell yeah. Be who you want to be. Yep. <laughs> yeah. I was wondering, cause you know, you said very early on that the whole reason that you came up with this is because in that book that you read, the guy mentioned magic tricks, but like yeah. didn't elaborate any, did you ever get back to the author and say, you yeah, know, I did it. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's so funny. Neil Strauss, who is the, he's like a seven or eight time New York times bestselling author and major, majorly connected like big, big deal. 
And I was really surprised, like two or three years ago, he asked me to speak in front of his mastermind of guys. And he had me speak on marketing and business. And this was the second time I'd ever actually met him in person. And up on stage, I was telling the story about how I got started. And I was like, Neil, on page 48, where I said to the group, I was like, on page 48 of Neil's best-selling book, here's the sentence he wrote that changed my life forever, which was something about you know, we made a straw pop out of the girl's glass or bent a spoon in front of her. It's like something, I can't remember exact trick. And I said, if I had not read the book, The 4-Hour Workweek, which said that if you possess any kind of interesting skill that you think other people would want to know, you can probably make a living teaching it. And I was like, and I didn't have many other skills, but I read that and I was like, that's a skill I got. And I was like, Neil, the reason I created this product and it's all because of you. And he said, well, how come you never reached out to me and asked me to promote it as an affiliate? I would have done that. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, I thought you were going to come out with this at any point. Like, the idea that you were going to create a product like this, because you could have, had me run in at 100 miles an hour to do it before you did. <laughs> so we kind of shared a laugh about that. But it was kind of cool to meet the people that inspired you to really change your life. Yeah, I was thinking that. I was like, man, that's like a good, you know, relationship or partnership opportunity. So yeah, I mean, I guess maybe a little bit too later, at least you got to it before he did and yeah. got your little piece of it. But cool. Well, by the way, just on that point, yeah. going back to this opportunorial mindset. So I didn't really cover this, but this is also, this is one of the things I actually am most proud of too, is back then I didn't feel like an expert in anything. I was 32, I had a degree in financial advisor for years. And it's so far different than something like magic tricks and digital marketing and all this other stuff. But there's a great book called Blue Ocean Strategy that a lot of people have read, which is just understand like there's the red ocean where it's bloody waters and it's super competitive. And you want to look for a blue ocean, which it's opportunities, but it hasn't been quite tapped yet. And oftentimes you have to create a blue ocean for yourself. So back then, the very first thing I did was I identified, I was like, okay, here's two markets that are overlapping, which is dating advice and how to do magic tricks. And you can buy lots of courses on how to do magic tricks, but they're built for magicians. And there was no course really about how to do this, you know, for dating advice, because if a guy who wants to pick up a girl in a bar goes out and learns a bunch of card tricks, and then he brings a deck of cards to a bar, he's going to look like a clown yeah. who's trying to use magic tricks to pick up girls. Mm -hmm. And there was this nuance that I recognized, which is how do you do cool magic tricks without ever bringing out like magic props? Like how do you do spontaneous impromptu magic tricks with things you would find at a bar and not ever look like you're doing magic? And so what I did is I you take two circles and you intersect them. Mm. And it's that really that thing that looks like an eyeball or like an eye in the middle. They call it the vesica Pisces. Mm -hmm. You go, okay, this is where the opportunity is. I'm going to teach just enough magic to the guys in pickup who will potentially want to do it without being a magician. And I'll do it in a way that addresses their concerns is I don't want to be cheesy. So I found two completely disconnected markets. I found the common overlap and I created my own sub niche in that space. And I was for the longest time, I was the only one teaching this. So when it comes to startups or when it comes to anything else, like always look for those opportunities where you can stand out and you're not just competing with everybody else. Yeah, I'm pretty proud of the fact that I saw that in my first real business. Yeah, great. <laughs> really great. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, I'd imagine that going from being a financial advisor to, I don't know if that was hard to explain to people. I went from financial advisor to I am teaching guys magic tricks online. Like, Oh, it was uh, super hard, especially <laughs> with, okay, my girlfriend at the time is my wife now to go, Hey honey, I just got laid off from the financial services job. And now I had had a little severance and I was like, all right, I'm going to, you're going to go do what? You're not going to go get another job. You're going to go do what? <laughs> okay. But then also with my friends, I was 32 years old at the time and I had a bunch of professional friends and they were like, you're going to do what? But I was just too, you know, optimistically ignorant to know otherwise. I was like, screw it. What's the worst thing that can happen? I'm just going to learn a skill and apply it somewhere else later. So, but it was funny that like all my friends made fun of me. I mean, you probably can imagine, like, just imagine one of your friends is like, yeah, I'm going to quit this professional job and go teach a bunch of nerds how to do, you know, magic tricks and bars to pick up women. You're what? And then all of a sudden I'm making six figures, you know, working from home and they're looking at me like, I'll be damned. Yeah. <laughs> that was pretty fun. 
Everyone's laughing thousands. until you're successful, and then it's like, mm-hmm. oh, wait a minute. Yep. Well, I should have thought of that, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. Um, yeah. Well, cool. So it's been great hearing about your journey. Everything from uh, magic tricks to podcast <laughs> hosting, you know, just everything Home you're brewing. doing today. Yeah, Home brewing, really, coffee. Really like, I mean, <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> Might have dip, jumped around a bit, but in a good way. We certainly loved having you on and learned a lot today and just appreciate you sharing all that with us. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, it's been my pleasure. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, it's been a great pleasure having you on. And I'm sure, you know, if any of our listeners are interested, we'll leave the show notes how they can get in contact with you and then check out your podcast as well, too. Yeah, that'd be fantastic. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Hey everyone, as promised, now that we've wrapped up the episode and learned a little bit more about strategic wins for those looking to acquire multiple digital assets, we wanted to connect you with some of the best listings in the content space today. So first we have listing 50232. It's a display advertising and affiliate business in the lifestyle niche. This one's pretty cool because it's got an email list starting in place, 2,800 subscribers. It's got a social media foundation already good to go. And it's also got a strong team of 10 staff members who are helping to manage the business. And they're kind of helping with everything from social media to scheduling and managing and monitoring the website. Unfortunately, the staff will not be continuing on with the buyer post sale, but the seller can share how the business is operated with the potential buyer. So there is a foundation to just share that knowledge that the staff had. And then, you know, if the buyer has a team in place, they can just take it and run with it and just hand it to their existing team. Potential growth opportunities include expanding affiliate marketing for additional revenue, introducing sponsored posts, and growing Pinterest, which is uh, pretty key because it is a lifestyle niche business and Pinterest and lifestyle brands kind of go hand in hand. So cool that they've already got the foundation to run with that and make it really work for those who love Pinterest. Yeah, it's really nice to see these types of lifestyle businesses coming into our marketplace because someone that might have uh, maybe a real strong connection with this specific listing could definitely pick it up. And if they already have a little bit of maybe Pinterest marketing skill sets or maybe a little bit of knowledge on how they could monetize the email list with over 2,800 subscribers through ConvertKit offers another great opportunity I noticed with your listing as well. And it it reminds me of a a great opportunity I noticed with the listing that I had chose this week. And that's listing number 50141, which is a subscription display advertising and affiliate business in the finance niche. So what's interesting about this particular listing is it includes two domains and it also has a Discord server with over 2,000 members. So the Discord server offers a, a great forum or a great um, platform to build up another quality relationship or quality marketing channel with your target audience. I mean, and also it does include a Digital Ocean account, a Trading View account, a Zine Foro forum license, Odeer account, and a super paid account, along with Twitter and YouTube social media accounts. So a lot of great accounts that are within the finance niche that are already set up for you already established and already have some traffic that are coming in from them. So that wouldn't be necessarily something you need to focus on. You could actually just focus on scaling those accounts, maybe even performing some marketing or maybe even some paid advertising to get more of that traffic or maybe even fixate a few pixels within these accounts to really drive some of the traffic into the actual listing or into the business itself as well at the same time. What's included as well is the subscription side of the business has VIP features and insight into a niche specific software within the finance niche. So they're not only providing these accounts for you, but they're also you know offering some features that are really helpful for those within this niche that are using this information to grow within the finance realm. So that offers is a great foundation of a business. You could ultimately reach out to other affiliates within the financial niche, you know, and maybe even expand the monetization, maybe add in a few monetizations that are not currently being utilized within this business. So it's a great opportunity for someone to come in that might know a little bit more in this niche and be able to capitalize on this, something that the seller has already built the foundation for. Also, if you take a look at the listing itself and the earnings and revenue, you'll see a large steady increase in both earnings and revenue just within the past 12 months. And there was a spike within September of 
2020 that was up at around quite a bit more in the 40,000 range as far as some of the numbers that we're seeing. And, you know, even within the traffic as well, there's been a steady increase throughout the year. So great opportunity for someone to come in, you know, utilize this traffic that the business is receiving and ultimately maybe pick a, a separate monetization that you might want to maybe go completely all in and and then you know, ultimately scale the business further from what's already been built. And that pretty much wraps up this week's episode of the Opportunity Podcast. So we hope that you've gained some valuable insight to the opportunities that digital acquisitions offer. And if you're interested, click the link in the description or visit empireflippers.com slash marketplace to learn more about these businesses or other listings currently live on our platform. If you've enjoyed this episode, be sure to leave a comment or a review, or if you would like, subscribe to the channel for more great content that's released every week. So until next time, we're your hosts. I'm Brandon. And I'm Sarah. And thanks for tuning into the Opportunity Podcast.